Hello, and welcome to the Logos Research Associates live stream broadcast. I'm Chris Roop, and it's my privilege to be your host for this presentation. Logos Research Associates is a fellowship of scholars and scientists that are committed to upholding a high view of science and a high view of scripture. We sincerely believe that scholarship, logic, and the scientific method can and should be used to show that the Bible's historical claims are both credible and ultimately superior to the secular model of origins. Logo sponsors many creation research initiatives and projects involving many different experts and scientific disciplines, all working towards the goal of increasing the explanatory power of the creation model of origins and of Earth history. The goal of this live stream uh, series is to provide for you the opportunity to hear from top researchers who will be conveying cutting edge scientific evidence for the creation account. Before we introduce the topic and invite our speaker to join us, we will open in a short prayer. If you'd please join me, I'll pray now. Dear Lord, thank you so much for uh, this awesome opportunity to share the truth of your word. Even if there are some disagreements on the topic tonight, Lord, we pray for goodwill, graciousness, and love amongst creationists as we discuss this in-house debate, which we are now going public with. Lord, we pray and ask for just your guidance and your presence. And Lord, ultimately, that many people would hear this, even those who don't know you, and say, you know what? This does sound credible. It makes a lot of sense. And they will consider the great news of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for many years, there's been an ongoing and mostly friendly discussion amongst creationists with regard to where the Genesis flood ended in the rock record. Does the Neogene quaternary boundary document the end of the flood? We'll show a geologic column in a moment. Or does the Cretaceous paleogene boundary? Put simply, did the Genesis flood continue well into the Cenozoic or not? More importantly, does it really matter? Well, it certainly does to creationists. It is a question that has profound implications for our understanding of several origins-related topics, spanning multiple scientific disciplines, including but not limited to geology, paleontology, biogeography, and genetics. It affects our perspective on diverse issues such as the origin of Cenozoic, of extensive Cenozoic geologic formations, the origin of massive amounts of Cenozoic coal, the origin of most land mammal groups, including cetaceans, which includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises, which first appear in the Cenozoic, the rate of post-flood adaptive radiation or speciation, and even whether there was even whether there was large-scale changes, such as dramatic transformation of a wolf-like creature, Pachycetus, for instance, into whales. Highly respected creationists on both sides of this issue have presented challenging evidence to support their positions. One of these highly respected creation scientists is here with us tonight, and I have the great pr privilege of introducing him to you all. Dr. Leonard Brand is a professor of biology and paleontology in the Department of Earth and Biological Sciences at Loma Linda University. He received his PhD at Cornell University in 1970 and has been, with, and has been on the LLU faculty since then. He has taught courses in paleontology, Sorry, I missed something. He received his PhD at Cornell University in 1970 and has been on LU faculty since then. He has taught courses in paleontology, vertebrate biology, and philosophy of science. His research focuses mostly on the process of fossilization and the geological factors that influence preservation of fossils, a field called taphonomy. He has published over 45 scientific research papers and numerous articles in church publications. He has published seven books, which have been translated into one or more other languages, he has received the Zapara Award for Distinguished Teaching and Best Student Paper Award at national meetings, a Distinguished Service Award, and a Lifetime Service Award from Loma Linda University. His strongest long-term interest has been developing a Bible-centered approach to the integration of science and faith. He has a wife and two grown children who have endured many of his research trips. Dr. Brand has spent more time in the field than anyone I personally know, and he has wrestled with the upper flood boundary is issue for many years. And tonight we will be he will be bringing further clarity to this very important topic. Dr. Brand, welcome to the broadcast. Can you hear me and can you see me? Yeah. Well, I can't see you. Okay. I can hear you. Excellent. Um thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to to present this tonight. I wish I could see all of you, but uh, I can't, so I'll try to remember that there are people out there listening. So <clears throat> It, although there's quite a bit of background material that I'll be going through before I actually get to the issues that 
that Chris talked about. But those are important things. The I'll, I'll introduce the field of taphonomy for those who are not familiar with it. Taphonomy is a study of how fossilization occurs. What is the process? How and why carcasses are fossilized, or if they are, why are they not fossilized? Uh, it's a very interesting and, and productive field. We try to answer a lot of questions. Uh, for instance, if you find a, a bone, a fossil bone by itself, uh, broken, there's a reason why it's by itself and not with a, with a, a carcass. There's a reason why it's broken. And all those things can help us to understand what happened with this, uh, with this animal. <clears throat> I'll also be talking a bit about changing perspectives. Uh, I've had to change my mind on some things. With experience, uh, sometimes things that seemed interesting are now seen as not just interesting, but uh, significant. And sometimes uh, we have to change our mind on, on things. So I'll, I'll refer here to two different features, particularly of the fossil record, uh, descriptive features. The first one is uh, from the pre-Pleistocene to modern world, there is an instructive change in the nature of taphonomy, the nature of the fossil record. Uh, upper Pleistocene fossils and on into the modern world, uh, I mean, those, those are like what we see happening in the modern world, essentially. Whereas below the Pleistocene, fossils uh, are in water deposited uh, sediments. <clears throat> so let's look at an example here, some examples, upper Pleistocene fossil sites. And these would be like an environment in the modern world. And of course, uh, a famous example is the La Brea tar pits. So here we have a picture of uh, downtown uh, Los Angeles. Uh, several thousand years ago. I think it looked better back then. But anyway, uh, uh, the it's an environment with the, with the tar seeping up into these pools and animals getting caught. It's a situation that could occur now. And so it, it's, a, it's a modern world type of situation. We have a shortage now of uh, ground sloths and uh, saber-toothed cats and mastodons. But otherwise, uh, it could happen now. So this is clearly like what happens in the modern world. And of course, animals can fall into ice crevasses. Uh, they don't really fossil, but they get deserved anyway. Uh, in Europe, there are acetic peat bogs that have some people that have been buried there. So these are uh, Pleistocene situations. Animals, typically the Pleistocene, at least the upper Pleistocene, get uh, caught in various kinds of traps that, that preserve them and um, can fossilize them. We get below the Pleistocene now, fossils are in water deposited sediment, like these sediments we see here in the Grand Canyon. So there is a difference from, from now to back into the, fo the fossil record. <clears throat> the fe feature number two that I'll be talking about uh, quite a bit, different categories of fossils. There are certainly fossils that are fragmentary and scattered. Uh, this is what we would expect con comparing uh, fossils with the modern world, with what happens in the modern world. Dead bodies in the modern world are recycled and broken. And there are a lot of fossils that are fragmentary and scattered. But there's an, another category that is, is in some ways more helpful. The wonderfully complete and exquisitely preserved uh, fossils. This is an enigma, at least an enigma to the, the standard model of Earth history because those fossils in the second category require a major break in the recycling process in order to be uh, preserved. So let's look at some examples of these well-preserved fossils. <clears throat> it's just an amazing fossil record we have. And uh, we, most of us don't really get a chance to see these very much. If you, if you haven't had such a chance, I'd suggest you spend time at the uh, annual Tucson, Arizona Fossil and Mineral Show. The dealers from all over the world come with their with their specimens, and you can see the, these amazing fossils. They um, we have a crocodile here. This fish uh, in the next the next picture is preserved in three dimensions in uh, in Brazil, the Santana Formation. Uh, you can apparently study 
internal anatomy from these fossils. It's that well preserved. Then a, a dinosaur and some nothosaurs. Um, and the, the, the one, uh, letter G, that hangs on my office wall. That's a Permian amphibian, about three feet long. And so these, these spread from the Eocene all the way down to um, the Devonian and the many parts of the world. So this is not a, a, a not an unusual thing. There are many of these. I'm just it's just amazing what there is out there. Uh, take this dinosaur. It has it has uh, three vertebrae in its tail missing. Other, outside of that, everything is there in beautiful condition. And there's a phrase I could use to describe this that will apply to many of these fossils. Every bone in place. Like I said, the fossils are not all like that. There are those that are broken and fragmentary. But there are so many that are that are like this, beautifully preserved. And that's especially interesting to us uh, tonight. So today, what happens when animals die? <clears throat> well, they disarticulate and rot and are recycled into the ecosystem. That's an important factor for, for our ecosystem, keeping it healthy. But it doesn't tend to preserve fossils. Bacteria, predators, scavengers do the job along with weathering, chemical and physical deterioration. And they do a, a job on creatures that die. Look at a couple of examples. On the right here on the top, you have bison, which used to roam in North America by the millions. Uh, the invading uh, pale face with their guns eliminated most of those bison. <clears throat> um, and before that, the Native Americans were, uh, would kill them for food and other uh, materials. And so there have been, uh, over the ages, millions of bison uh, killed. And then go to another example here in Africa, the wildebeest. They, again, are, are in huge numbers, a million, maybe more than that. And probably there are too many for, for their habitat. They have to uh, make long uh, treks each summer for to find food. They have to cross uh, swift and dangerous rivers and thousands of them drown. In fact, uh, some years, 10,000 wildebeest have died and, and become dead carcasses in a, given, in a year, plus the millions of bison carcasses. So there should be a great fossil record of these animals, right? No. All the wildebeest bones, gone, bones are gone in seven years. There are, there are people who have uh, followed up on a, a year when there were 10,000 carcasses and followed up year by year to see what was happening. And by seven years, uh, all the bones are deteriorated and, and gone. You don't find any more bones. And finding bison bones is a very rare experience. And it isn't sure whether any of them will actually become fossils. So this is what happens today in the modern world and does not produce wildebeest uh, fossils. Now, someone might think, well, yeah, this is a, one example, but it, it, does that really apply to, uh, to the others? Well, this is one definite example that's been well documented and followed up. And uh, we can say that the, 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 the modern world is not really set up to preserve fossils. <clears throat> So contrast the wildebeest and bison with the fossil record. These bones are not going to last long, uh, but here's what we find in the fossil record. Tremendously well-preserved uh, creatures. And you might, someone might be thinking, well, this guy probably picked out a few examples to make it look that way. Well, if you have those doubts, I'd suggest you go and spend time at, in Tucson and, and see for yourself. More fossils. There are so many kinds of fossils. Um, if I really showed you what I'd like to show, we'd be all night looking at pictures. But the invertebrates, and these generally have fairly hard shell uh, exterior skeletons. Uh, but again, they're, they range in, uh, through uh, quite a bit of the fossil record, often with great details preserved, all these spines and the trilobites, uh, wonderful uh, crab specimens. And again, there are so many of these. And soft-bodied fossils. We can't forget the soft-bodied creatures that are preserved. 
like that insect up there at A and a flea B. There are many plants preserved and uh, uh, insects like the dragonfly. And then at E, a water strider from China. Uh, and more, more uh, insect larvae in H and J, a crane fly in, in I. And then on, on the lower right, these are small squids, uh, beautifully preserved. And the one at G, that's a trilobite, but this is different from the others. This is a, 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 a Ordovician trilobite from New York State, has soft tissue preserved. The antennae and the details on the legs, that's all soft tissue, uh, beautifully preserved. So such excellent preservation, how does that happen? <clears throat> now, remember if the radiometric dates were correct, many formations would accumulate sediment at a millimeter or less per year. But well-preserved fossils require burial much faster, at catastrophic speed, actually. And even in a, in a flood model, it's going to be a um, fairly slow deposition, certainly more than millimeters per year. But even an inch or, th or three inches per year is, is slow to do what we need to do to make these fossils. Predators, scavengers, and bacteria are important parts of the recycling process. And just a, uh, some more examples to impress on you what the difference is between the modern world and the fossils. This cow up in Wyoming, where we were doing research, made a poor decision, tried to cross that cattle guard. And uh, when this picture was taken, the insect larvae, after a few weeks, had removed all of the flesh. It was just bones and and skin. A year or two later, it was. It looked like bee, and then as time went on, this, there were just scattered bones lying around. And bones, as time goes on, fall apart like these. They, this is what well, this is a weathering, the uh, physical and chemical deterioration of these bones. But we don't see that in the fossils that we're looking at. In E and F, you, this is in Africa. This scene happens, uh, of course, very often. The flesh is, is stripped off pretty fast, and then the bones don't last for a long time. So that's the um, what happens in the modern world. And But these fossils are absolutely amazing. The individual fossils are just the beginning. Uh, in Arizona, at the, at the Tucson show, we see uh, numerous math, mass death assemblages that are there for you to purchase. Uh, here we have a, a wide variety of them, from ammonites and A, a couple of types of trilobites, starfish, uh, and then an E, crinoids, um, squid, and of course many fish, uh, scallops, and um, here in the bottom, in the middle, nautiloids, and then more ammonites. Just and these these are actually only small samples of uh, very extensive uh, mass death assemblages. So they these specimens keep going out from the fossil show, and the dealers bring more. There's there's a tremendous amount of this kind of material in the fossil record. So do these mass death assemblages do they represent living habitats where the animals are living there and getting preserved? No, they are transported assemblages. Uh, rapidly flowing water is very effective in sorting the items by size, shape, and other factors. In this case, uh, sorting the fossils by, by shape and by size. And uh, these are sorted and concentrated by flowing water and rapidly buried. So the mass death assemblages are transported. Um, They've been brought in, one like J, that is clearly uh, transported because the nautiloids are all lined up in one direction. The others are not necessarily quite like that, but they are <clears throat> they, they are uh, transported assemblages brought together by flowing water. And you find even, even more interesting details. And uh, in H, we have uh, scallops. In our research in Peru, the fossil whales, there was there are places where you could see several levels 
with, with uh, masses of of um, uh, of uh, clams. Okay, several layers, one above the other, and these layers that the clams had been sorted by size. Each level had a had a unique size of these uh, clams, which are, are articulated very quickly, very either uh, killed, either buried when they're alive or just dead. And so it's amazing what water does with uh, materials. So what is the explanation of all these fossils? Death and burial by normal processes like we'd see today? No, absolutely not. Wildebeest bones gone in seven years. And that's just the final result uh, after the last bone disappears. The, most of the carcass is gone long before that. Here in, in Peru, you find many of these whales that look like this in beautiful condition. Uh, these are Miocene whales. And in the modern world, there's been study of the taphonomy of whales. A whale dies, the flesh is gone in a few months, the bones are gone in a few years. And yet you find these fossil whales just beautifully preserved. So when we read papers about fossils, there are interesting descriptions often of how it, it, this is believed that this happened. Uh, some cases the animal dies, falls in a river, gets caught in a bend in a river, gradually gets uh, buried. Well, that's not gonna do the job. Um, it, even in a post-flood scenario, it may be similar, but happens faster, but still it takes unique conditions to, to really preserve well uh, a fossil. So what's the explanation of the fossil record? Many times you read papers that this will say that the fossils are preserved by being in anoxic water, no oxygen. So no oxygen, the bacteria can't do their job, right? Well, that is that is not right. <clears throat> the papers where they say that, they're not reading the literature carefully. There have been experiments, uh, several experimental studies done and published showing that anoxic water does not slow decay. Uh, you take a shrimp or other soft body creatures, put them in tanks with either oxygen or no oxygen. There's, there is no, uh, no significant difference in the rate at which they decay. So why would that be? Well, it's because when an animal dies, the bacteria that be initiate decay are typically coming from inside the animal. And those are anaerobic bacteria. They don't need oxygen. And so anoxic water does not prevent decay and does not necessarily even slow decay. So that's not the answer. <clears throat> there really is no alternative to rapid catastrophic burial from many of these excellently preserved fossils. And just how rapid, we really don't know. There actually could be more uh, study on that, trying to figure that out. But, of course, we do have fossils that are uh, disarticulated. So they've had time, some time to lie around and disarticulate, uh, either partly or completely. So what happens to them? Well, here's an, an ichthyosaur on the top picture. It has had time to disarticulate completely. And yet look at those bones. You don't, you don't find any of the kind of deterioration that you see in the modern bones here at the bottom. You don't see any of that. They are beautifully preserved and the solid bones. They don't show the disintegration of bones, which we refer to as weathering, that occurs with the wildebeest and other uh, modern creatures that die. Another, another example, there's a dinosaur quarry in northeastern Wyoming. It's been uh, quarried for at least 20 years. Dr. Chadwick, uh, a colleague of mine, runs that quarry. And they have collected at least 30,000 bones. And, and all these bones have been uh, collected, uh, prepared, and, and uh, cataloged. And they, they document uh, many features, including things like weathering and abrasion. And for 30,000 bones, weathering is almost non-existent. So you don't see this kind of weathering that is in the lower right picture. 
<clears throat> and some quarries, of course, dinosaur quarries or others, uh, when they open the quarry, the quarries even have the smell of death. Now that's amazing. To whatever was involved in, in the decay and death of those animals, it's still there when you open the quarry. That that speaks to uh, unimaginable uh, well uh, preservation, good preservation. And of course, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, bones that have preserved protein or tissue in the bones. And the biochemists know that this material will not last for millions of years, a few thousand years, probably at most. So, and the excellent preservation is not just for large bones. Um, we'll look at some medium sized ones here and then some smaller ones. Even smaller bones are excellently preserved. This is a, a fossil. Um, turtle from the Bridger Formation. And these turtle bones, you see here in the middle, top middle, the, the surfaces between bones, the articulation surfaces, are very, have very delicate articulation uh, details. And those are well preserved in all of these bones that I've seen. And I've, I've uh, studied these for a number of years. In the lower left, you have, have a small mammal skull. This is a, a quarter for scale. So that's a small mammal skull, uh, exquisitely preserved. That skull is now in the American Museum. Look at some more of these smaller uh, creatures. Here's a, an amphibian, Permian amphibian, a relative of the large one that hangs in my office, but this is only a few centimeters. And again, you see this, the same story, every bone in place, apparently. And a cricket, well preserved. And then the bottom, um, these are small vertebrates from the Bridger Formation, Eocene Bridger Formation. We uh, studied turtles and also did quite a bit of screen washing. Uh, and when you screen wash, um, you, you separate the, the sediment from the bones, uh, from the fossils and other material. And here you have a lot of uh, bones from one of these screen washed uh, situations. And so they're broken but many of them are small. And, and these are all solid bones, solid, very well preserved. You don't see any of that uh, physical or chemical deterioration that I showed you from modern bones. These little bones are all beautifully preserved. And again, I haven't selected unusual specimens. This matches what I, what I have seen from other um, fossil assemblages. So no physical or chemical disintegration. This just doesn't seem to happen with these fossils. They end up being beautifully preserved, no matter uh, what, where they came from, what size they are. Here's a, a Cretaceous Cetacosaur dinosaur. Um, again, every bone in place, and the bone is are all very solid. None of this deterioration that we see in the picture on the right. And it's the same throughout the fossil record. To, to risk uh, overemphasizing this point, uh, I have here fossils from A, from the Oligocene, down to H, Lower Cambrian. And there's, these are uh, from small ones to larger ones. So here are uh, uh, rodent. This is a uh, this is a rodent skull. Um, just a couple of centimeters, in fact, less than two centimeters long, uh, a larger mammal. And then these are these are both Oligocene. Uh, in C, we have a, an Eocene um, horse. And then D, we're back to our Cretaceous dinosaur. And going on down uh, in F to the Permian, uh, two amphibians, every bone in place. And then G, the, the uh, Ordovician, trilobite with soft tissue, and then this uh, beautiful lower Cambrian trilobite. So the size of the animal, the geologic age, does not seem to matter much. We find this kind of preservation all through the record. <clears throat> and so bury these at a millimeter per year? Um, no, I don't think so. These had to be buried at a catastrophic speed in order to be preserved the way they are. 
but we may you may we may be thinking well we need to not be too uh, too hasty on this maybe we just need to think outside of the box for explanations that can work well that should be done we need to think carefully of all the possibilities and what the evidence can tell us about them okay but these these fossils are, are typical of what i've seen uh, in, of many fossils and there are so many it's not just there are not just a few examples that are challenging there are so many of these there really isn't any box um, that, that ha has a room outside of it to, to explain this. Um, I would challenge anyone to, to find an adequate explanation for all of these things outside of very rapid uh, burial. There are so many fossils, so many amazing fossils. A dinosaur like this uh, might be uh, partly reconstructed, but there are others that I've shown you that are, that are uh, clearly buried the way they were and these uh, just a, a wide variety of things beautifully preserved every bone in place in the modern world animals do not get fossilized they go through the processes we've discussed um, decay and disarticulation and scavenging and they just don't get preserved fossils are only formed in catastrophes they have to be quickly buried and preserved. But even these modern catastrophes that we see around us at times uh, are really not adequate to do the job. And they, they don't seem to preserve um, fossils in any, any kind of quantity at all, if any. The only catastrophe adequate to produce the fossil record, I would suggest, is the biblical flood. Okay, <clears throat> now let's move on. If we accept the flood model, the next question we need to think about is when was the formation formed in what condition? Uh, after the flood, after the animals left the ark, or during the flood? So there's three options here. A, after the flood, after the animals left the ark, and the rocks and organisms are, are go through modern day processes. Or you could have a situation after the animals left the ark, uh, the sedimentary processes are still much more catastrophic than at present. And the, the animals had to you know, deal with this to survive. Then the third option, during the flood, Noah's animals are still in the ark. Uh, geologic process is still strongly catastrophic. So these are just three of, of uh, certainly in, in many variations we could think of. Main differences being, when did the animals leave the ark? Now, when in the geologic column did the animals leave the ark? And there are many questions that we, that we all have about this. And the quality of preservation that I've been showing you, taphonomy, is, is one of several lines of evidence that can help us to, uh, to look at that question and try to come up with a good answer. So how much of the Cenozoic was post-flood? And this is where uh, people who believe in the flood have differences of opinion. When do we infer that deposits are post-flood and represent modern paleo environments? There are two primary uh, points of view that I know of among uh, flood geologists. The early arc landing, the arc landed early Cenozoic, some, sometime down here. And so the rest of this time, then the animals were living on the earth as it is now more or less then the late arc landing <clears throat> um, that's another point of view it comes late in in cenozoic and uh, i've argued with some friends for years about these things and uh, i'll tell you more later about my my point of view and how it has changed so we'll examine several cenozoic examples uh, looking for an answer to that question. First example, one that we've already uh, discussed, Pleistocene fossils, the La Brea tar pits. Uh, that's obviously post-flood. I think we'd all agree with that. And uh, things like these acidic peat bogs with humans preserved, that's certainly post-flood. So 
And there are, there are some other Pleistocene fossil assemblages like, that are more or less like fossils in the modern world. Overall, the Pleistocene fossil record is meager, uh, especially upper Pleistocene, and characterized by unique traps that preserve uh, a very biased fossil record, not like what we find uh, deeper in the record. We'll look at two Cenozoic examples, Oligocene Badlands in South Dakota and the Eocene Green River Formation. The Oligocene example of the Badlands National Park, I've spent time there in the last year or two and found it very interesting the, the, form, the, the Badlands have several formations present. The prominent ones that we see mainly in these cliffs in the, in the Badlands are the Sharps Formation and the Brule Formation. Uh, 29 to 34 million years is their date, their uh, radiometric dates. And these are, are described as savannas, river channels, and floodplains producing these deposits. And so I'll show a couple of their dioramas. They have very nice uh, scenes here in their visitor center portraying how they believe these animals were living. So here you have uh, some, some forest and uh, open uh, grassland savanna. And uh, another one, uh, also savanna. And so the animals that they suggest were living in this kind of environment. And out here you, in, the, in, the, uh, in the plains, you have uh, rivers. Um, meandering across the landscape and producing the sediments that we see uh, in this national park. Okay, let's, when you go from the visitor center though, these beautiful pictures and go outside and look across the street, uh, it's an interesting contrast. This is what the Badlands sediments in, in South Dakota look like. They are very layered, uh, layered uh, sediments. And they have these interesting brown layers, which makes it easy to see what the sediment is like. And these, these layers can go for long distances. Um, a geologist friend of mine is the one who, who mapped these. And of course, there, a lot of this is divided into hills and, and mountains, and you can't really follow the layers for long distances because of that. But but the, the, the fellow who did the mapping, he identified a couple of, of larger uh, layers, like this brown layer in the bottom uh, right, the middle one. I think that's one of his marker beds that have been mapped over the entire region, hundreds of square uh, kilometers. Okay, so this is these are very distinctive layered uh, deposits. I, I spent some time there, took a lot of photographs and made panoramas so you can trace these layers farther across the landscape and then drew some some lines to, to show what we really have there. It's amazing how distinctive these are and how far they go. And they're, they're definite, you look closer, they're definite uh, layered deposits. Um, very distinctive. So what kind of a record? If these are produced by uh, river, meandering rivers, floodplains, what kind of a record would you expect such a river or floodplain to produce? Well, on the left here, we have a diagram of, of a meandering river. And they move from, from side to side, and they leave behind very complex deposits. They don't leave uh, nice, even horizontal layers complex deposits and they, 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 they lay these deposits down, another river may cut it through them again uh, and, and make them even more complicated. And again, rivers, rivers follow a, a, a path that they have, the channel that has some constraints. They don't just wander randomly over thousands of miles, at least that's not what we see in our modern world. On the right, you see the Mississippi River uh, certainly this is a river that meanders through time, but the, the arrow shows the width of the floodplain, and the river normally stays in that floodplain, meanders back and forth uh, within the floodplain. <clears throat> and that's where it leaves its, its sedimentary deposits. And so, okay, a meandering river, 
going through its channel, is that going to leave deposits that look like this on the bottom? I, I have serious doubts about that, that that could be uh, the explanation for these layered deposits. So how do we fit together that diorama with these, with these layered deposits? To me, these two ideas don't compute. The explanation has to be different. This looks like a much more of a catastrophic deposit with, with layers being spread over very large areas, um, hundreds of miles and or more. We compare those with the Mesozoic landscapes, Mesozoic and, and Paleozoic actually. We have uh, sedimentary units that cover huge areas. You can trace these across here and many formations cover thousands of square miles, hundreds of thousands of square miles. And uh, how are you gonna do that with a meandering river or a floodplain or similar kind of situations? In the bottom in B, this is this formation here is the Straight Cliffs Formation. And it forms this cliff in, uh, in Utah called the Straight Cliff, as, as, as you might not be surprised. The straight cliff with the straight cliffs formation. And this goes around a corner, but not it's not a serious corner. That this cliff is almost straight for 50 miles. It's called 50 Mile Mountain. And you can trace these um, sandstone units just on and on and on. Um, I one time with a helicopter and uh, doing aerial photography, i we flew all the way down this 50 mile mountain and uh, photographed the whole thing with uh, still pictures and, and video. It, it's an amazing deposit. Um, and I just don't think that's going to be produced by a meandering river or anything similar at all. So that's the Badlands rocks. Now let's look at the fossils, the vertebrate fossils. They have a, there's a lot of beautiful fossils. Here's a rodent skull, another rodent, a small one, a mouse. Um, larger mammals, Oreodon, uh, Archaeotherium, Titanotheria, um, Hyracodon, and here we have uh, ribs. All these bones are beautifully preserved from small ones to large ones. You don't see anything like this picture on the right, uh, modern day um, breakdown of bones. So there's considerable reason to think the Badlands was a catastrophic deposit. If so, a paleoenvironmental interpretation of this Oligocene formation should not be based on environmental understandings from the modern world, from the, from the modern world, because this is not like what happens today in the modern world. Okay, let's go to the Green River Formation. <clears throat> Many of you are very familiar with this uh, formation, and. Flood geologists uh, have differences of opinion about this, this formation. Either was it a post-flood deposit? Was it during the flood? So there are, there are these two point of views, points of view are held by different person. Most who prefer an early Cenozoic landing for the Ark would, would see the GRF, Green River Formation, as a post-flood deposit. And if so, it was an established post-flood lake environment. And the animals of the GRF should be interpreted as living in an established functioning lake. Others think this formation was deposited during the flood. So how do we deal with this? <clears throat> Does the GRF represent a living habitat? How do we decide? Well, <clears throat> let's look at some. Uh, there, are, there are a number of evidences that are that seem to point to a settled environment, an established lake. It's the mix, the sediment is not a mixture, a catastrophic mixture of sediments. Uh, it's a, a very typical uh, kind of sediment that you would expect to form in a lake. Um, these these uh, sediments, of course, at one time filled the entire area. Much has been eroded away, but here we see them in these hills. And they, they are, um, like I say, a, a characteristic type of sediment. And if you look closely, it occurs in very fine uh, laminations, very thin 
a many uh, a millimeter or less thick, and they are in a, they are not. Um, this was not brought in by flowing water. This is a lake deposit in a specific basin. In the upper right, you see a map of these. I've seen maps that portray these different basins as all being part of one original basin. But in any case, whether there is one or several, the, the sediments have accumulated in a basin, one or more basins. And mu much of the research on the Green River Formation has been done up here in the these in Wyoming, the um, Green River uh, Basin and, and uh, Fossil Basin. Uh, Dr. Paul Buchheim, <clears throat> here you see in the lower right, was a colleague of mine for years, several decades. He was at the faculty of our, our geology program. Um, his special, his research was specializing in the Green River Formation. And I had the privilege of, of working with him for many field seasons up there in Wyoming, the Green River Formation and the, the associated uh, Bridger Formation. He is, is recognized by other geologists as a, an expert on the Green River Formation. And he was sure that this deformed in a, ba in a basin after the flood. And I, I uh, agreed with him for many years. I actually found myself on both sides of these of this argument in different times as to where this fits into the flood. The GRF fossils, they're almost all lake dwelling organisms, so it fits with the, this environment. Um, there are some bats, not very many, but a few bats, some using horses. And so of course those we don't think lived in a lake, but they could easily get washed into a lake. The others are, are lake dwelling creatures so uh, turtle crocodile innumerable fish millions of fish and that was no exaggeration uh, plants and on the lower in j this, this mass of uh, fly larvae preserved fly larvae and some of this evidence and some other evidence is interpreted as specific lakeside habitats you, you, you follow these sediments in the fossil basin, for instance, you can see where it came to what obviously had to be a shoreline. And it's there by the shoreline where you see um, fossilized insect larvae, and those kind of flies will live around the edge of a lake. Uh, there you find the, the small fish. Bigger fish are out in the deeper water. And so all these things are interpreted as established lake environment. But look carefully at the fossils. And <clears throat> with all of this, this fossil material I'm showing you, um, I've, I've looked at these things for years and I finally started realizing what I'm looking at. What is the significance of these wonderfully preserved uh, creatures with every bone in place uh, and so many detailed features? Uh, how did that happen? even in the Green River Formation. And look at the, the two up here in A and B. Um, those are, we'll look more closely at those. Those are coprolites. And for those of you who are not, not familiar with coprolites, that's fossilized dung, fossilized poop. Okay, here's one of the, the I'm showing on the, I think on my, on my screen, one of my favorites. Uh, this fossil sits on my, on my desk. It's a, Obviously, a, a coprolite, and a, from the size, I would say that is probably a crocodile. And then there are fish. You have pictures here of fish coprolites. Um, there are innumerable fish coprolites. And the, the, the left picture, there's one of the larger ones. And then you see the next picture, three others there. And you see some, in, and everywhere you look, you find coprolites, fossilized fish poop. And the lower right, picture shows the uh, close-up of the sediments that they're in. And this this one at the top, the crocodile, whoops, sorry. Um, he is buried in 180 laminae. I counted them under a microscope. They are these uh, thin laminations. And many people interpret these as varves. A varve is a term for a specific process 
that produces one lamination per year. Now, Dr. Buchheim published a paper with some good evidence showing these are not VARs. They don't fit that description. Um, but, but no matter what they are, uh, if you take any kind of a reasonable time estimate for this, you still would have only one or a few laminations per year. Okay, think of this crocodile poop lying on the bottom of a lake for a century. It lay there for a century with no damage. Not a chance. Um, water currents, other animals would, would damage that thing uh, very quickly. So that something is wrong there. Something needs to be, needs a better interpretation. That had to have been buried uh, very quickly. Now saying that, I don't know how we will explain these laminations and I don't know anybody who has an explanation. If these have to be produced very rapidly, we need to understand or we'd like to understand how it happens. And I don't think anybody knows how that could happen. But look at the fossils, there they are, so wonderfully preserved. These fossils require very rapid burial. <clears throat> and this will not happen without catastrophic burial. And that includes these fly larvae there with one of the evidences that was told to me is an evidence of this being a shoreline and in a, uh, a normal lake environment. But those had to have been buried uh, catastrophically to be preserved that way. And <clears throat> the small fish along the shore as well, which are well preserved. And anoxic water won't help. Um, sir, catastrophic burial seems inescapable. This is a, a, a picture of the model that has been used for years to um, describe the, 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 light, the lakes up there in the uh, Green River Formation. Deep lakes with anoxic water at the bottom. So you have oxygenated water in the top. And if this sits here and is not disturbed too much, the water on the bottom will be anoxic. And it was, it's thought that the creatures that die will then sink down into that anoxic water and there they will be preserved. And that explains why we still have them in such good condition. Well, a, a geology graduate student some years ago <clears throat> did research to, to test this model. Uh, in eastern United States, there are a number of lakes like this, deep anoxic lakes. And he would take a boat out on the lake and use a dredge to bring up sediment from the bottom, bring a number of samples of the sediment to see how many skeletons he could find. So what did he find? No bones, certainly no skeletons, but no bones, period, in any of these lakes. So the anoxic water just does not produce uh, fossils. That's, that's not an explanation that's going to work. He studied one other lake as well in Southern California, the Salton Sea. And it's, it's not quite like this. It's not, an, it's not a deep anoxic lake, uh, but it, it has some other features that are interesting. It's a saline alkaline lake, which is similar to the Green River Formation uh, lakes. Those were th thought to be, at least part of the time, saline alkaline lakes. And so this, this is a model that could help us to understand the Green River Formation. So what did he find? Preserved bones? He found some bones and some fish scales. No skeletons. But, he, but there, are, there are some bones uh, preserved there. Okay, anoxic water won't help with the Green River, but was the will of water chemistry help? It has been suggested that the fossils were preserved because of the water chemistry. Well, that research in the Salton Sea suggests to me that, that the water chemistry might help a little bit, but not anywhere near enough to explain those fossils. Catastrophic burial seems inescapable. I suggest to you. So how do we fit these two factors together? Evidence for a settled lake environment and catastrophic fossil <clears throat> preservation. Um, is there a way to preserve the fossils slowly? And I would say no, definitely not. But there are things we still need to look at. Uh, features for more research. The Green River Formation is not uniformly fossiliferous. Some parts are very fossiliferous, others not. 
Could some parts be catastrophic and other parts not? Well, that would deserve some, some look, looking. Does the lake chemistry differ significantly in different parts? I've spent a lot of time walking over this Green River Formation. Um, I have trouble seeing those kinds of differences as you go from one part of the formation to the other. But, but I don't really know. Um, it, it would be good for somebody to study those things and try to figure them out. And also another question we need to ask, need to ask could there be another way, a more catastrophic way, to explain the evidence that looks like an established lake environment? Those shoreline areas with the small fish and the fly larvae, which have to be catastrophically preserved. But is there some way, uh, a less, a, a, a more catastrophic way that could explain those and help us to understand why there's evidence that looks like an established lake environment? <clears throat> and in any case, there has to be a way to rapidly form these thin carbonate laminae. It seems that nobody knows how, but, but uh, we, we'd like to understand if that happened, how did it happen? There are so many questions yet uh, to be answered. So how much of the Cenozoic was post-flood? That's the question we're looking at. Um, do we infer that the post-flood deposits represent modern paleo environments? Well, <clears throat> I found myself on different sides of this issue at different times. And for, for many years, I have advocated the early art landing in the early Cenozoic. Um, and if that's, well, come back to that. Um, I found myself having to change my thinking because of the evidence I've shown you. And the fossils, the, the, the taphonomy doesn't answer everything. We can't base our decisions on just one issue, but it is a very important one. And it has important things to say. And it brings us to this third question. What is the explanation for the fossil sequence? And, and it's the fo vertebrate fossil groups are not randomly placed in the fossil record. They occur in a predictable sequence in the Cenozoic. And there are two primary explanations for this. Uh, one, a post-flood microevolutionary sequence, animals adapting and, the, and evolving somewhat after the flood. Or two, the sequence resulted from sorting processes during the flood, perhaps related to ecology. Um, years ago, I remember an argument between several of us about these issues. Uh, my friend uh, Lee Spencer saying it has to be number two. Uh, some of us saying, well, no, it must be number one. And <clears throat> if the GRF and the Badlands were post-flood, then it had to be post-flood evolution for at least a good part of this. Um, if the GRF and the Badlands were catastrophic, sorting of vertebrates during the flood somehow. And so there are these, these options and, the, and what, how we understand these middle um, Cenozoic formations is very important for trying to address uh, these questions. And like I say, I've, I've had to change my thinking because of, of the evidence that finally hit me in the face. I look at these fossils for years finally realized what I was seeing. And uh, <clears throat> this has made me change my thinking on this issue. So I still say the only catastroph catastrophe adequate to produce fossils like this is the biblical flood. And so thank you for, for listening and uh, perhaps there are questions you'd like to ask. Dr. Brand, excellent presentation. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so far, we have at least one question coming in. Uh, we'd love to move on to a few more questions if they come in. So let's take a look here. One of the questions is from Bill Payne um, through YouTube chat. He says, can we collect fossils from the Green River Formation? I think what he's asking is, can anyone or do you need a permit? Well, <clears throat> many years ago, I collected some before it became a national, a national monument. Now you have to have a permit. <clears throat> uh, when, when Dr. Buchheim was still with us doing that research, he had permits 
uh, to collect fossils. So if you're if you're doing research, you can get permits uh, to collect them. You can also, of course, there, there are private quarries out of the outside of the park <clears throat> park that are all the time uh, quarrying and digging up numerous fossils, and so it's possible to get them that way through those quarries or at the Tucson Fossil Mineral Show. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question there. So this is from uh, another questioner asks, uh, Lucinda Hill, what are your thoughts about Lee Spencer's observation that the Cenozoic Great Basin in 30,000 foot thick, which I guess is which is, sorry, I think uh, there's a typo. It's 30,000 feet thick and requires catastrophic processes. Well, <clears throat> what I've talked about is, is the way, a feature that I have to use to address this. And, um, you know, Lee and I used to differ and argue, and, but, uh, you know, the, the, the evidence I've showed you is, is, Lee, is pushing me to agree much more with Lee than I used to. Okay, great. So I don't see, here's another question just came in. Um, have you partnered with Institute of Creation Research or Answers in Genesis for your research? Um, no, I haven't partnered. Um, I've, I've worked with various people, uh, creationists or non-creationists, but I, I haven't partnered with those two organizations. Well, for me personally, I think that if you wrote an article, it would probably easily get published in ARJ or maybe ICR's publications. Um, anyway, something to think yeah, about. I, there's some articles that they're likely to go in that direction. Yeah. Another question. This is from Ryan, the Raptor guy, uh, commenting on YouTube again. Dr. Brand, how would you address the occurrence of genera within the same created kind, both above and below an upper Cenozoic flood, post-flood boundary in the same geographic location? Okay, I'm aware of those kind of questions that are being asked. I haven't really uh, done a lot of thinking about them. Um, <clears throat> years ago, probably 20 years ago, I remember deciding that uh, I'm really not interested in any, uh, what I would think of as theoretical uh, questions about the flood or the end of the flood. I, what we need is physical evidence, field evidence. And that's where I've spent my time over the last uh, few decades. So I don't know the answer to his question. Very well. Here's a questioner, um, Bill Payne again says, I thought flume experiments show bimodal slurries will separate into thin beds even though current is constant. That depends on your situation. I'm, uh, I'm, it, it will, it can do that, definitely can do that. Uh, the, the flume experiments I am have been associated with, have observed, are in relatively shallow water and produces these thin beds. Um, I, I suspect there are a lot of other situations that would, could differ quite a bit, but uh, more work needs to be done on that. All right. Any other questions before we wrap up and end in prayer? I'm going to wait just one short moment. Well, I remember going with you, Dr. Brandt, to visit the, the formations in the Badlands, including the Brule Formation. And um, that seemed to be really impactful for you. Was that kind of like the turning point for you in your, in your thought process on this, or was that just a, one piece of the puzzle? That, that was, a, that was an important process? piece. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that was important, and I, I, I find them the <clears throat> what I saw there in the Badlands to be to very clear and and, uh, and, and important, and yes. that that along with some other things has has caused me to to think clearly, more clearly about these fossils and realize what I've been looking at for many years and hadn't really seen it yet. Wonderful. Well, I think that's going to be it for tonight. Um, we did have another comment. We're looking for questions, though, but we'll, we'll see if we can throw this in there. What about Spencer's observation that the pattern of first appearance, stasis, and then replacement of fossil species is similar throughout the fossil record until Upper Cenozoic? Um, that's an important observation has to be considered. And then, like I was saying, I haven't 
those kind of uh, what I would think of as theoretical questions have not uh, interested me that much, <clears throat> but they need to be looked at. Yeah. And finally, we have a from Frank. He says, thank you, Dr. Brand. Excellent presentation. I would agree. Very fascinating. Um, for our audience, thank you so much for joining us. We're just so glad you've, you've shared your evening with us. The recording of this video will be available on our website. So please share it with anyone who you think might be interested in the topic, might be encouraged for by hearing about all this evidence really for the flood. This is evidence for the global flood. So it's not just an issue about when the flood ends. So this is, I hope, has broad appeal to many people who may have doubts about the Bible, doubts about whether you can trust the history in Genesis. And as a reminder, we want to encourage anyone watching to check out Logos Research Associates' website. On the website, you can learn about the various research efforts of all of our associates and ambassadors and find information about their publications. Please take a few moments to browse the website and consider supporting one or more of the exciting creation research projects that are underway through Logos Research Associates. While you're on our website, please be sure you have subscribed to the Logos email list so you can receive notifications about our other upcoming presentations. When you subscribe, you will also receive the Creation Evolution Headlines newsletter. Our next presentation will be posted soon on our website. Uh, you can visit logosresearchassociates.org anytime for updates. I'm now going to close in a short prayer, but before I do, I just want to encourage anyone who wants to dive deeper into just topics relating to faith, reason, and earth history. Here's a book by that title by none other, by none other than Dr. Brand. Um, I've read through the whole book. It is an excellent book. Let's see if it's blurry here. It is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And it's a very easy read. So if you're intimidated by the scientific jargon, um, it is well explained. So with that, uh, let's just close in prayer and then we can, um, we can say goodbye. Dear Lord, thank you so much for our audience. Thank you for everyone tuning in, for asking questions, for just being interested in the things that uh, have significance for not only just what we think and what we're disagreeing on as creations, but that has eternal implications. If the flood is true, if it was global, and that means God does judge his creation. God, sin does matter to God, but God is also loving. And he's not willing that any shall perish, but that all should come unto repentance, which means turn from sins, recognize that there is a God who wants to forgive you, love you, and receive you. He is a heavenly father. He is a good father. So I want to encourage everyone to think about the more important uh, issues relating to this topic, and that is, what what is the condition of your soul what is more important than your soul consider that before the lord because he gives you the free gift of eternal life through the blood of jesus who died on the cross for our sins he took our place on the cross bore our sins all of our sins all the things we've done wrong so that he could he could bear the penalty for our sins instead of us and he forgives us freely so that's what this is all about thank you all again for joining us and i hope to see you all in the next broadcast Dr. Brand, thanks again. God bless.